Which VCR is right for you, VHS or Beta? Home media has an interesting history. What started out as silent black and white projections on blank walls in homes has evolved into now having the ability to watch movies in your basement on a certified IMAX private theater. Many of us have witnessed the rise and fall of VHS and seen full HD morph into 4K with 8K TVs now on the horizon. With technology changing so much, it's easy to forget how much has happened to us to get us where we are today. But suppose it's over three hours. Relax. Panasonic VHS takes up to four hours of sports, movies, specials on one cassette. Take a short trip down nostalgia lane with me to relearn a short history of home entertainment. Hi, I'm Isaac, and this is Movie University. On this channel, I do educational videos, reviews, and the occasional original production. Be sure to check out my MU swag shop on teespring.com and enter promo code MU2017 for 15% off at checkout. In the age of Netflix and chill, it's hard to imagine a time when we couldn't watch whatever we wanted from our phones while laying comfortably in our beds. But some of you are old enough to remember a time when you had to purchase 8mm film with condensed versions of movies on them. Home movies started becoming popular in the 1950s when Kodak began releasing 8mm film, affordable cameras, and projector equipment allowing them to be accessible to the masses. These first films were home videos of families or celebrations, and almost always without sound. Only the very wealthy could afford to build screening rooms within their homes. These dedicated home cinemas were outfitted with 16mm or sometimes 35mm projectors for showing Hollywood's latest hits. During the 50s and 60s, 16 or 35mm movies were out of reach for a large majority of Americans. Sometimes, if you were in a school audiovisual club, you might be able to convince a movie studio to send you a print of a desired film in 16mm. And even then, it might be a condensed 20 minute version of the film. Things stayed this way for about 20 years until the 1970s when Sony's Betamax was released in 1975. Sony Betamax and the portable Sony videotape camera, you can do just that. You can record what you want, when you want. A year later, VHS was introduced and the competition to see who would reign between the two formats became known as the Format War. Choose a JVC video home system and you'll get a picture as true and as reliable as JVC technology can make it. Some people swore up and down that they could see a quality difference with Betamax, but most people couldn't tell. This totally new concept in home entertainment will expand your enjoyment of television viewing to a level that was, a short time ago, nothing more than an ambitious dream. And the deciding factor for VHS to win out would be the ability for people to record two hours worth of content versus the one hour of content that Betamax originally offered. Now on video, if it's excitement you want, then remember, adventure does have a name. Indiana Jones. Let her go. Alongside these two formats, Laserdisc would be introduced to American homes. The format could play both analog and digital audio. This allowed for special editions or director's commentary tracks to be added into a film. Philips bring you pictures from a silver disc. Highest quality pictures and sound on laser vision. The formatting also allowed people to instantly jump around to any part of the movie because of the digital format. This was an advantage over VHS and Betamax tapes, which could only be fast forwarded, rewound, or paused. But consumers did not like the price. The discs were the size of an LP and weighed close to half a pound. Each side could only hold 30 to 60 minutes of information, so the disc had to be flipped in the middle of the movie, and some films required more than one disc. With laser disc, you won't believe the difference. The discs were also easily damaged. The players were loud because of the amount of power needed to spin these large discs at the proper speed. While LaserDisc did offer superior video quality, digital sound, and could include widescreen formats, it was not adopted by more than a few million people in the US, and it never caught on in Europe. The final nail in the coffin would be the much higher cost for both players and videos that turn people away. The last movie to be released in North America was Bringing Out the Dead in 2000, and Japan stopped releasing movies in the format the following year. Pioneer would continue making laser disc players until January 14, 2009. 
While you may never have had a Laserdisc, you certainly benefited from the technology. Laserdisc would lay the foundations for CDs, DVDs, and Blu-rays. While Laserdisc never caught on, VHS continued powering forward and improved over time. The two hour time limit was ultimately pushed up to four or six hours per tape, depending on the quality you wanted to view your recording in. If you were like me as a kid, you recorded TV shows over the airwaves so you could go back and watch them later. For me, it was Star Trek The Next Generation and Star Trek Voyager. When I had saved up the money, I would buy blank VHS tapes. This of course after you had consulted with TV Guide to see which episodes were airing what nights. If you didn't have a blank segment of tape, you had to decide what to record over if there was a particular episode you really wanted to see. Hard decisions were made back then. And of course, you had to have Maxell or Ampex tapes. Not those awful ones made by TDK. These blank tapes took up a ton of space in my room, and of course, the quality wasn't the best, with some things being edited out for the sake of commercial time. To this point, when you could only watch movies and TV shows over the air or rent them from a store, you could watch the same episode of the same show in two different parts of the country, but see two different versions of it. This was because back then, there were fewer mega cable companies. The local cable companies would trim scenes to fit their commercial needs. This is why the marketing of some movies or TV shows being released during this time frame included the phrases uncut or unedited or something of the effect. To make matters worse, blockbuster movies like Star Wars, Ghostbusters, Die Hard, or others might only be aired once a year or only during the holidays. So it would be a family affair to gather everyone around the TV to watch these movies when they were broadcasted. One interesting aspect of home media during this time, and especially for VHS, was that the Motion Picture Association of America, the company that attaches film ratings to movies, aggressively fought the ability to record movies from home. You can actually read about MPAA President Jack Valentine lobbying to Congress about the need to install chips in VCRs to prevent the ability to record shows from home. A link to his proposal from Monday, April 12, 1982, in front of Congress can be found below. In short, Valentini argued that people would pirate the heck out of movies and TV shows being broadcasted over the air and millions of dollars would be lost in revenue for the film industry. People did record TV shows and movies and sports broadcasts off the air and watch them later. But most people though didn't do it to sell copies and make a profit but rather to watch the movie or show or whatever later at their convenience on the cheap. You could spend a couple of bucks on a blank tape to record a movie being broadcasted versus buying the same movie or show for 30 bucks at your local store. The average price for a movie and became known as a popular price for a short time. Even with these popular prices, most people just couldn't afford too many movies or shows. Sometimes companies appeared to help people out by having movie clubs or rewards programs, but those still weren't as affordable as you'd like especially if you were like me, a poor, unemployed 10-year-old. Even with these movie fan clubs, you still didn't have the money for such a luxury for a full-priced movie every few months. However, different versions of TV episodes, degraded VHS tapes, and debates over the right to record over the air were about to become a thing of the past as the 1990s entered the scene. Invented in 1995 by a collaboration between Philips, Sony, Toshiba, and Panasonic, the digital video disc, commonly called DVD, catapulted home media forward in a big way. See how good a movie at home can be. With over 3,000 titles to choose from, make sure you see your next movie on DVD. The discs were smaller, held vast amounts of information for their size, lightweight, did not wear out easily like VHS tapes did, offered the luxury of interactive menus, and best of all, they were cheaper and comes with a unique feature allowing you to access your favorite Star Trek scenes instantaneously. Fascinating. While a Laserdisc could retail for around $100, a VHS tape for $30, a DVD would sell for around $20. When it was introduced in the United States in 1997, it was not immediately adopted by everyone. However, by June 2003, movie rentals of DVD would start to eclipse VHS ones. During the late 90s, you might have heard of a little known but notable alternative to DVD called DivX. Only DVD players with DivX play both DVD and DivX movie discs. 
DivX lets you watch movies at home for about what it costs to rent. Rolling out to the masses in 1998, this rental-only style of home media required you to buy a DivX player and a DivX movie disc and then pay for every subsequent viewing of a movie. The players would only work if hooked up to the internet via your phone modem. Once you made an account with the company, you could purchase encryption keys to allow the player to decode the disc. Each key was $4.50 and was only good for one viewing. You could, however, purchase DivX's silver or gold programs for a movie, allowing additional viewings and on multiple DivX certified players. But because of the huge upfront cost for consumers, the nickel and diming to death of subsequent views, and negative PR the company got because of the way it required an internet connection, the format only lasted a year. While DivX was dying a quick and unnoticed death, DVD got an adrenaline boost. Adoption to the format was as expected in the early years, occurring slowly but surely. However, two factors helped DVD get adopted fairly quickly in my opinion. First was 9-11, and the second being the ability to put special features on a disc. When 9-11 happened, it changed the US. Many emotions came out during the next several years. One of those that manifested itself was fear. People were afraid to go places. Having saved up for vacations they no longer wanted to take because of the fear of traveling, people spent money on home entertainment. This can be seen in DVD sales charts. While DVD was already being adopted, it got a big boost after the events of September 11th. Secondly, DVDs allowed more storage than VHS. This allowed willing studios to create new content called special features, which were a novelty. Special features gave customers another reason to upgrade to a DVD system. What we take for granted today in the form of behind the scenes videos being released on YouTube or on bonus disc were a novelty for its time. While some DVD releases had next to nothing on them because their release to DVD was rushed, some catalog titles had an incredible amount of bonus content and thus began the horrible journey for home media enthusiasts of double or triple dipping on one title. Case in point, the Lord of the Rings trilogy was at minimum a double dip if you wanted all the behind the scenes content for the extended edition DVD sets. And with all these re-releases of movies in their special editions, chances are if you missed the initial release in stores, you had to go to a specialty store like Suncoast or Barnes & Nobles to get it. But more on double dipping in a minute. Not long after DVD began to win its war over VHS, the technology industry was struck again with the release of high-definition DVDs and televisions. While HDTVs were still a novelty in the late 2000s, they were being adopted by the general masses in ever-increasing numbers. HDTVs were released in the 185 widescreen format, allowing a new level of entertainment purism and getting rid of those black bars when watching movies in the letterbox format. Within 10 years after releasing high-definition movies on disc, consumers would no longer be able to find full-screen TVs in store. Gone were the days of pain and scan full screen editions. Thank goodness. Who would fill your TVs with high def movies? On one side of the aisle, you had Toshiba's Red Case HD DVDs being released in 2006. Not to be outdone, Sony began releasing its Blu ray format players shortly thereafter. Having learned from lessons past, both companies wanted to avoid a costly format war. However, a deal could not be agreed upon. HD DVD sales started off strong. The red box high def format had more titles, less buggy players, and was cheaper than its blue counterpart. However, Sony responded with an aggressive marketing campaign and armed its PlayStation 3s with Blu-ray players allowing people to play games and watch movies from one machine. Compare this to the Xbox 360 where you had to buy an HD DVD player add-on to play the high def movies. In just a couple of years, the second format war would conclude in 2008 when the last movie studio, Warner Brothers, announced it would no longer be releasing its movies in both formats. High definition TV required high def source material. Hollywood would soon release content in native HD, but older catalog titles would take time to catch up and required a lot of money. Some movies and TV shows never made it to Blu-ray, and if they did, they never got a proper transfer. Some of those that did get a proper transfer though were Star Trek, Star Trek The Next Generation, Lawrence of Arabia, 2001 A Space Odyssey, Star Wars, and Blade Runner. These restorations required studios to shell out a lot of money to have a third party company come in and scan the original film negatives and digitize them. To clean up the dust, remove artifacts, and correct color levels. Sometimes rescore the music and then maybe redo the effects. 
in my opinion, Star Trek The Next Generation was basically completely redone in order to get it to the quality you see on Netflix now. The restoration team had to find all the original film reels, do everything mentioned before. The restoration team had to find all the original film reels, do everything mentioned before, and then also use the original cinematographer notes from the time of original production to reconstruct every single scene to include the correct light levels from all 176 episodes. It's probably never going to be ever be done again in the history of home cinema. Fascinating. Disney has probably been the best of all the studios when it comes to guarding their old content. Restoring it, creating new content for each release to get people excited. Disney also did a lot of impressive restorations such as releasing Sleeping Beauty in widescreen in HD. The restoration of Lawrence of Arabia is also another achievement in film history. The David Lean directed movie went through a three year restoration process in which international distributor Park Circus scanned in the 1962 70mm film reels to 8K resolution. The movie was downscaled in 1080p for a Blu ray release in 2012, with a 4K digital release happening a few years later. Film restorations are impressive, but they require movie enthusiasts to shell out money repeatedly for new editions. And with everything being on streaming services these days, the money just isn't there anymore to do all these cool restorations. Remember talking about double and triple dipping? Some studios gave re-releases of movies extra care because they know their fans will love the new content. In the age of social media, fans who love content will talk about it fervently and spread the word online, thus giving companies free publicity. The 2007 release of Blade Runner, The Ultimate Edition, treated fans to all five versions of Blade Runner, an exhaustive amount of behind the scenes content, and audio commentaries, and an impressive packaging suitcase. Harry Potter fans have been treated well by Universal as well. The studio released an impressive 31 disc set on Blu-ray, DVD, and digital combo, and then re-released the movies in 4K, giving the films a noteworthy restoration in both film and audio qualities. However, studios don't always do their fans a justice. Paramount Pictures screwed fans in 2013 when releasing Star Trek Into Darkness. To get more shelf space at retailers at a lower price, Paramount divided up its bonus content between major retailers. Target, iTunes, Amazon, and Best Buy each had exclusive bonus content that you could only see if you purchased the movie from their prospective stores. This pissed off a lot of fans, and some people didn't even buy the movie outright of protests. Similarly, this happened with Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol, also a Paramount movie. With the rise of streaming platforms, retail exclusives began to fade away, except for the steelbook editions of movies Best Buy continues to pump out. The 2010s continued with improved picture quality and sound. 3D televisions and curved screens had short lifespans and are barely found now, while high dynamic range coloring is all the rage and found on nearly every TV sold in stores. 2016 brought the ability to have IMAX Corporation install a certified theater in your home for the low price of $400,000, and they now have their own brand of IMAX certified equipment for home entertainment called IMAX Enhanced. Couple all this with the advances from Dolby and the Dolby Atmos sound format, Dolby Vision certified TVs, plus other advances from Sony, LG, Samsung, TCL, and DTS, home entertainment is now absolutely incredible and in some ways better than going to a cinema. And with all this content we just covered, we didn't even talk about the advances of sound to include going from mono to stereo, surround sound, and now spatial sound with DTS-X and Dolby Atmos. Not to mention, you can watch it in widescreen, listen to audio commentary, choose from features. Of course, you know how the story ends. Blockbuster passed on the opportunity to buy Netflix, which started the downward trend in disc sales. This, in turn, led to their incredible streaming service once faster internet speed spread across the country. For years, the sales of home media is what helped finance the restoration cost of movies, and with sales shrinking year over year, who knows where the home market will end up. Streaming services offer undeniably great content and adequate quality. But with so many to choose from, and the way they are all set up, we are right back to where we were about 10 years ago, with companies having control over the content you see, and having to pay a hefty price to get all the content you want. And even then, you still might lose some content even though you paid full price for it. 
I have previously campaigned for the purchase of physical discs on this channel before, and I continue to believe that physical media will always look better than streamed. At least until internet speeds improve and more data can be pushed via the internet to improve sound and picture quality. Who knows? The way we're doing things from our 5 inch TV screens now versus our 65 inch screens, people probably won't care about pixel counts in the near future anyway. When did you first get into home media? Have you cut the cord and stream only now? Do you still buy movies on disc? Let me know in the comment section below and consider supporting me on teespring.com. I'm Isaac and this is Movie University. Thank you.